Hi everybody and thank you for joining me on this video presentation from ARIA AP Talk series. In these videos, I present every week patients from our AP lab. I would also like to invite you to visit my website for additional case presentations and the highlights of the latest important published research articles in the field of cardiology, electrophysiology, digital health, and of course, COVID-19. Today, we will discuss together three patients with frequent ventricular extrasystole from left ventricular outflow tract. The first patient is a 62-year-old man with frequent ventricular extrasystole with a PVC burden over 39,000 per day, which was refractory to medical therapy and admitted for RF ablation. The baseline ECG of this patient shows frequent monomorphic PVC, inferior axis with a transition zone around V3. A closer look at the PVC morphology shows that the PVC origin should be somewhere in the left coronary cusp. We see a fat R wave in V2 and V3, which suggests an epicardial origin, in this case, left ventricular outflow tract, left coronary cusp. Based on PVC morphology, we use the retrograde approach to start mapping the left ventricular outflow tract, especially the coronary cusp. And here we find this signal at the successful ablation site, which was almost 40 milliseconds earlier than the beginning of the QRS complex. This figure shows RAO and LAO projections in fluoroscopy images and targeted 3D mapping in left coronary cusp. Earlier, we saw the successful ablation signal with a small cast potential, and here is the ablation effect. It's very important to have and search for this cast potential during ablation of the PVC in the cast. Many patients with frequent PVC have normal left ventricular ejection fraction, normal LV size. It means that they have apparently normal hearts. After ablation, we always have to answer this question. Is there an increased risk of sudden cardiac death? In the next slides, we see an interesting study which tried to address this issue in patients with frequent PVC and apparently normal heart. The purpose of this study was to determine the prevalence of scarring detected by delayed enhancement cardiac magnetic resonance imaging in patients with frequent PVCs without apparent structural heart disease and to determine the value of programmed ventricular stimulation for risk stratification in patients with frequent PVCs and myocardial scarring. Figure A shows a 62-year-old man. This patient had no history of ventricular tachycardia and VT was non-inducible with programmed ventricular stimulation. The MRI image showed a very tiny small scar in septum. In B, we see the CMR of a 65-year-old patient with symptomatic PVC, a PVC burden of 22% and an ejection fraction of 45%. The patient had no history of VT or syncope. However, the MRI showed a large scar in septum. During programmed ventricular st stimulation, several monomorphic VTs were inducible and the patient underwent implantable cardioverter defibrillator insertion after the ablation procedure. During follow-up, ejection fraction improved to 55% and PVC burden remained below 5%. In this study, no VT was inducible in patients who showed no scar in CMR. Interestingly, there was no difference in pre- and post-procedural ejection fraction between patients with inducible VT and patients without inducible VT. Patients with inducible VT had similar rates of reversible cardiomyopathy. And among patients with a scar, the risk of inducible VT increased with a total amount of a scar independent of pre-ablation ejection fraction. Going back to our first patient, we see here the MRI, which shows an ejection fraction of 51% and no scar area, no late gadolinium enhancement, which based on the study that I presented, we can say that the risk of sudden cardiac death or VT inducibility or VT during follow-up is extremely low. The second patient is a 65-year-old man with a high PVC burden who had two previous ablations in RVOT and LVOT before referring to our center for third catheter ablation procedure. In this patient, we will see the importance of detailed ECG analysis and also the value of having different access during catheter ablation of PVC. 
In baseline ECG, actually, we see two dominant morphology. The first one is more compatible with an exit in coronary cusp. We see the fat R wave. And in the second one, we have a right bundle branch block morphology, which is more compatible with an exit at automitral continuity and below the coronary cusp. In this case, we have two possibilities. Either we have two PVCs or more probably we have one PVC located somewhere between these two structures with oscillating shift and therefore two morphologies. Because the first morphology was more common than the second one, we decided to have a retrograde axis and map the first morphology. In this case, as you can see here, we located the earliest point to the left coronary cusp and we successfully ablated the first morphology. However, still we have frequent PVC after ablation of the first morphology with the second morphology. So we decided to go below the coronary cusp and map the second morphology. The RAO and LAO projections here show the earliest point below left coronary cusp at automitral continuity. However, we had early recurrence after ablation at this location. So we decided to change our axis from retrograde to transeptal. And finally, with transeptal axis, we successfully ablated the second morphology here at automitral continuity. And in the next figure, we will see together the successful ablation signal. The third patient is a 72-year-old man with a PVC burden over 60,000 PVCs per day who was admitted again for RF ablation. In this patient, we had also two PVC morphologies. However, the difference between morphologies were more prominent compared to the previous patient. The PVC1, which was much more common, showed the right bundle branch block pattern, inferior axis, compatible with the left ventricular outflow tract. The second one, however, has a right bundle branch block morphology, inferior axis, and an RS transition between V3, V4, which was even later than transition zone in sinus written. The first morphology, as expected, was successfully ablated below left coronary cusp, and here we see the RAO and LAO projection of the successful ablation site. RAO and LAO projections in this figure show the successful ablation site of the second morphology in left coronary cusp. In this final figure, we see the successful ablation site of both PVCs in 3D mapping system and also the best pace map of the first PVC at orthomitral continuity and the second PVC in left coronary cusp. In superimposed fluoroscopy images, we see the successful site of the ablation of the first PVC at orthomitral continuity and the second one at left coronary cusp. In this uh, short presentation, we see together the importance of cardiac magnetic resonance imaging in risk stratification in patients with frequent PVC and apparent normal heart, and the importance of detailed ECG analysis and approach to patients with different morphologies from outflow tract. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you are interested, you can find some additional case presentations on my website. Once again, thank you for joining me and I hope to have you here in my future video presentations.